Well, hello, everyone, and we are in our third to the last session of our 12 hour webcastathon. And we are actually broadcasting from a different day. Um, we are, I was going to say it's November 12th, Saturday, November 12th, which is, is here for me in Chicago, but we're speaking today with um, Camille Dixon Dean, who is in Australia, where it is a quarter to 10 in the morning, so on the 13th. So, how's the 13th treating you? <laughs> What's it like? Gonna, what can we expect tomorrow? It's going to be cloudy for you guys. <laughs> it's going to be cloudy. <laughs> Sunday. Okay, everyone. Camille's telling us it's going to be sun cloudy. Um, but we're so excited to have Camille here for many, many reasons. First of all, she is a wonderful volunteer with Designers for Learning. She's been uh, part of our team on the last two MOOCs. And we also had the opportunity to work together um, and see each other a couple weeks ago at AACT. So it's great to catch up again. Um, but with that, Camille, just tell us a little bit about yourself. What, what do you do? What do you doing down in Australia? Okay, so I'll give you my life history. My life history has been that um, in my country, education is very streamlined. We, we don't have the ability to um, create new jobs the way North America does. So you become, when you go to education, and education is free in my country, um, that's tertiary education, you become a doctor, a lawyer, a scientist, which is most likely computer science. They're all the traditional avenues are there for you. So I did computer science. Uh -huh. And um, out of that came an ability to go to my master's in Rochester, New York. With, uh, on a government scholarship where the government pays for you to do your master's with the hope that you come back mm -hmm. and re-educate and repopulate the knowledge base of the country. Did that. Um, through that, I was, I was employed in a college where I was sent to teach, which I was like, that's not what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to be designing and programming, right? Uh -huh. But <laughs> ended up teaching. Didn't like it at first, but then grew to love it. Because what I noticed is that in my country, in Trinidad and Tobago, we're very diverse, exceedingly diverse. And um, what I noticed is the abilities differ on entry levels when you look at tertiary education. And seeing that tertiary education in the Caribbean is free, mm -hmm. then, you know, it's, it's, it, it fluctuates. So having been at that job, I got a Fulbright and I went and I did my PhD. That's why I was in the States for so long. And um, during that process of trying to find a way to, um, how should I say, combine the diverse nature of the delivery systems and the needs of the, the delivery systems in the Caribbean with the um, technology infrastructure that we have in the Caribbean, which fluctuates, as people know. Um, my husband's in, in that side of the world. He's mm -hmm. in the infrastructure. So trying to find a system that would work. And this was all my grandest idea. I'm going to go solve the Caribbean's problems with education and access and knowledge and come back and rejuvenate the country. Yeah. So I'm in Australia. So... <laughs> <laughs> So you never made it, you, did you ever make it back, your original plan was to go back home, right? Was that the, the original plan? That's idea? my original plan. So I can tell you this, that I have worked with a university in the Caribbean for more than 10 years now, delivering online programs, and most importantly, delivering an instructional design um, master's program. So I am working with home, and I'm working with the university, but being home is a lot more difficult for me in terms of delivering the type of knowledge base I would like to deliver and maintain. And it has to do with access and it has to do with ability and it has to do with resources from internally to support that network. And I do think that my network to give back to my country is stronger externally than it is internally. So that's why I'm here. And I'm here mainly because I believe that 
our field is based on um, a lot of theoretical knowledge. And I believe that I had to do more practical work to inform that theory. Mm-hmm. And in some instances, debunk the theories that pre-exist where we somehow take it carte blanche that whatever the theorist said works, no matter what the context, and that's not true. And I'm not saying that the theorists are saying that they should work carte blanche, but there's a perception from those who are receiving the education in our field that the theories are and should be implemented carte blanche. And um, so the work I'm doing is a mix of both. So here I'm in the... In, one of Australia's first um, professional positions. I'm a, pro- I'm a professional based on what my description is, but I'm on a tenure track. Okay. So, which is very rare. I could not find this in the US. I could no. not find it in Canada. No. And this is what I've been looking for, be able to design and help practitioners and help instructors design, yet still research why it works and publish out of that research and have to get grants to facilitate that research. So um, that's what I'm doing and that's where I am. <laughs> that, that, that's, um, th- like you said, that's kind of the dream job. <laughs> that's what I would have loved yeah. when, I, mm-hmm. uh, when, I, when I, I graduated, when I think I, my PhD when I was like 45-ish or something. And the thought of starting out as an assistant professor was like more than I could. <laughs> More yeah. than I could bear. <laughs> you know, I to actually do fun things, you know, until I got, you know, really things that I really wanted to sink my teeth into, which mm-hmm. is, you know, it's a, that would be a whole conversation in of itself, right? The the yeah. structure mm-hmm. of, of of how to, um, you know, how to bring people in into our field. You talk about diversity when you first started. I mean, it's very much structured. To, you're going to keep getting the same thing. <laughs> you're going to keep getting. Um, yep. All the way through. Well, it, it's, it's difficult in the Caribbean because a lot of people, I don't know if you understand, a lot of people look at the Caribbean and don't understand the mix and understand the diverse and the contextual nature of the islands. Yeah, describe um, that. You've said that a couple times when we've been talking together, you know, before this, that, you know, like describe mm-hmm. what that is. Like, when we say it's diverse, does that mean people play nice better than we may here? <laughs> or is there like, well, what, does that, what does that bring no. to it? Not <laughs> more groups? <laughs> there are core groups. groups and there are, um, in, in the Caribbean, it's, it's just a little different. You have the big island mentality as opposed to the small island mentality. It's not the best way to describe it, but that's what it appears to a lot of um, people as. But... Um, and of course, what happens to the large islands seem to have more um, control of what we call the Caribbean community at large. Um, and the more prosperous countries, I should say, have more control. Um, but I, I can tell you, I mean, I've lived on two. My mother is from another one. My mother's from Grenada. My husband is, Bar- is from Barbados, so he's called Bajan. Mm-hmm. I'm from Trinidad. And um, Barbados, Trinidad, and Jamaica are the, what you call the larger resource bases for the, um, the Caribbean. And the makeup of each of those islands differ drastically. Trinidad is exceedingly multicultural. This is one of the few islands where um, uh, a, friend of me, a friend of mine sent me a picture, and I hope I could, I wish I had the copy of the picture to post in the chat, but... Um, we just celebrated Diwali a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if any Hindus are on, online. And these are all national holidays. All of the religious holidays are national holidays for everyone. Mm-hmm. And you would say that um, our country is one of the few. And he had a picture where you would see a Rasta, which is a guy with dreadlocks, um, with a Muslim lady. And a white guy all buying deers to celebrate his Hindu, uh-huh. um, the Hindu festival. Everybody's buying the deers, which is the little clay containers where you put the oil and you light the wick. Okay. And it makes a pretty picture when you light all of these. And the deer is probably like a dollar. Mm-hmm. And in one of the few countries, I don't know if there are any other in the world, where we celebrate everything and everyone, no matter what. We, we fight bitterly. Don't, don't forget, we fight. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when it comes to, we are all about celebration and parties. You know, we can put aside everything if there's 
a celebration and party just keep, the, just long enough the closest to, we probably have is what like saint patrick's day here like everybody's <laughs> irish on saint patrick's day that's like the one i can think of that comes to mind in the united states where everybody's irish for a day <laughs> No, when that comes into a classroom, when that culture and that um, diverse nature comes into a classroom, you then get traditional lines being drawn sometimes. You get traditional lines because we're still in a paternalistic um, society. Or you may get a religious line being drawn where I've had um, Muslim students who are males who would tell me they will not like to be placed in a in a group with another female because she's very outspoken Mm, so mm -hmm. (coughs) sorry (coughs) you do get um the traditional behaviors that are individualized religiously or culturally or ethnically um being pervasive within the classroom but externally (coughs) they tend to or we say mesh and blur, you know, in the society as we go on. And that ties in very well into what I've researched, which is what I did my dissertation in, which is individualized differences. The, the idea of having individual differences and understanding what that brings to any context there is. Mm-hmm. So beyond, <laughs> um, you know, oh. the ones- but the ones we tend to think of, you know, the ones that get shut down, the learning styles or things like that, you're, you're saying like truly like cultural differences and you know, <coughs> what your perceptions are when you come into the learning experience based on your past experiences, those types of things, is that? Well, no. So if you look at, and, and Dave Johnson is one of my professors at Missouri, if you look at his book, him and, I um, can't remember his quarter, Grabowski, did a book on individual differences. Mm-hmm. And what he's talking about is the innate differences that no one can see. You can have a person who's culturized to be Muslim, don't talk to women, be submissive. But based on what other factors that that person gets in the environment, they could change their belief system and not say a word. Right? So... This, the, the two that I focused on were field dependent and field independent. And um, people can look that up. It's, and it's mainly, I use it in the context of online learning because what I was looking at is how people um, actually get aware of the environment in an LMS and how they find things in the LMS and how they progress in an LMS. Because typically, if, for all those who know, if you're an educator online, it takes a, a new student about three weeks mm-hmm. out of the eight or the six week period. It doesn't matter how long mm-hmm. the period right. is. So half the it time they're them, just, mm-hmm. half the time they're just trying to figure out mm-hmm. <laughs> where am I, where is stuff lo- where is stuff located, and to get that kind of comfort level to progress in the in, in the course. But this is three weeks out of any semester, mm-hmm. right? That's a quarter, no matter how you look at it, a quarter or sometimes even a half of the semester. Try to just get a comfort level in terms of how do I learn and what do I come here, what I came here to learn. Whereas in a face-to-face environment, it takes you, what, a day, two days? Mm-hmm. So okay. looking at that, um, it can be a challenge going forward. And I just kept thinking about home where I have different cultures in my classroom, different age groups in my classroom, and trying to get them all together. In my, in my culture, food is the be all and end all. If you bring food, everybody gets quiet and everybody plays nice. Mm-hmm. So you bring food, everyone sits down and they eat and, and they can talk about anything. But the minute the food or you just want to focus on that one thing, they, they, you see all the clothes come out and the angry voices get raised and everything, but you have to get them on a common ground first. And my idea is how do you get people on a common ground in an online environment online. Mm-hmm. on the, let's say day three for the max, because you need to focus on the content. And here we are focusing on the environment. Oh, I can't find a link 
oh, the, the book is no longer available, open access, what do we do? You have all of these different challenges when you're in an online context. And for the Caribbean, seeing that there's so many islands using this one university network mm -hmm. or university system, how do you connect all of these people with different ISPs and different bandwidth situations and different abilities to use technology to be on day one or day three on the same page to get to the learning? Mm -hmm. And so, so Camille, like, how does this all transfer then to the work you're doing at ACT? Is this is there is it interrelated then? You know, like your interest within your dissertation and what you're interested in, and it, and, um, and what you're it doing. isn't related because I do believe that as instructional designers, I think we've taken uh, um, ACT is what I call my professional home because uh, as an, I see myself as an instructional designer at heart, mm -hmm. a learning designer more so, a learning scientist more towards who uses technology. Um, my work at the ACT, I am the board rep for culture, learning, and technology division. I'll try to find the link and, on that. We, yeah. I, I, and I apologize. I keep saying ACT all day, like, like everybody yeah. knows what that is, and then yeah. they, they don't. So let me pull that up real quick um, as you're talking. Go ahead. And the idea be behind the word culture, which is very um, vague and subjective in meaning to a lot of people, the idea of culture is what draws me into any environment. And I, I mean, we intersect, I believe we intersect with all of the divisions in one way or the other. Because I could tell you, um, I'm an on, I'm, I do a lot of online works, so that's distance learning division. I do a lot of design and development. That's design and development right. division. I teach mainly faculty. That's teacher ed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So I, I don't really teach students. I mean, the students in my class are normally teachers and faculty members. So we intersperse that idea of cultural learning and technology intersperses every division in some way or the other. We use a lot of emerging technologies as an emerging technology division there. Um, especially when I look at the Caribbean, we can't use the typical technologies of North America or anybody who has great access internet-wise users because mm -hmm. I have students who may still be on dial-up, mm -hmm. right? I have students who may be using their phone to do their assignment, and that's a very real situation. I, I kid you not. There are lots of students who use their phone to do their assignments, to type their assignments on a day-to-day -day basis, because they don't have the access and they don't have the technology to do so. They can't afford to. Mm -hmm. So um, it is very related and it is very dear to my heart in terms of moving forward in this initiative. And I think AECT is, is a ripe ground to have these discussions. It, and I've been a member of ACT for a long time. I don't even know, ten, at least 10 years, but maybe even longer. I'm not sure. I have to go back, <laughs> go back and look at my programs from when back then. <coughs> one division, um, I think it's like you were kind of saying sort of-ish. Maybe you didn't say this and I'm reading into it, but I think we tend to bundle, like, if it's, international <laughs> like oh that's handled by that division at least that's my perception and then as you're saying but within that everybody's talking about distance learning they're talking about design and development and all those mm -hmm. things so what I, go, ahead. go ahead well i was going to say how how can we work on that as a uh, perception i guess within the organization that it's um i just Honestly, at first, I just thought it was a place where all the international students came and hung out. I truly did. I was like, oh, cool. I feel like they've got a home, so you know they're gonna all congregate, <laughs> just hang out. Yeah, yeah. So there is an international division, and then there's a culture, learning, and technology division. Ah, so it's, okay. it's, it's, okay. there's a little variation there, but um, we are an international organization and understanding what it means or unpacking that, 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 that word international is very important going forward. Because I think um, the North American perspective and the European perspective, and I mean, an Australasia expect, um, perspective on the definition and how in the word international should be used, very. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
I could tell you, um, I used to be a very, I used to work very heavily with PMI and IEEE and ACM and the international organizations. And in the Caribbean, there's this old um, belief system. It's, it's very underlying that still membership and organizations invite you to be a member mm. and not you go you and join. But yeah, you that, are a member yeah. joining. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I remember like my dad, my dad is where I got my IEEE, um, how should I say, membership or inherited my ability to join IEEE. And he was invited as an executive to join in IEEE. And he looked at me and he goes like, how can you just walk into someone's organization and say you're a member? I said, well, that's what I do here. And he goes, that's not appropriate. You have to be invited. That's inappropriate. Uh, <laughs> so... So when we talk about culture and understanding and internationalization and everything, you have to understand what other perspectives are out there of how membership is aligned and how people look at membership and how people use memberships. All right, so that's one part of it there. All right. Another part of it is understanding that contextually, and I didn't, um, when I was doing my dissertation, I did a lot of little research studies. And one of them was defining with, with my advisor, Dr. Moore, Dr. Joy Moore, um, the difference between online e-learning and distance learning. Mm -hmm. And people were like, who cares? Or so what? There's a difference. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? I go, really? So, and, I, and this is the challenge I posed to her. And she says it, it was a really good premise at the time. Uh, I still think it's a valuable premise. What do people around the world define as online learning? What do people around the world define as e-learning and distance learning? I could tell you in my context of the Caribbean, distance learning is correspondence learning. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. It's not the same by definition, but that's what it's interpreted as. Mm -hmm. And then through our research, we found out that some countries, I think in Asia, define online learning as having a face-to-face -face component. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whereas some, it's just the opposite. Online means asynchronous to a lot of people. That's right. But we have these definitions that are out there that uh, just, this, this is what we are supposed to use as a definition. But people are not really using those definitions when they say that this is contextually what we are doing. And then that translates into the research. So when you get into research and you're reading all of these great studies about this is an online learning class, no one describes the environment. Mm -hmm. No one describes what the students were doing. They just said that this is an online class that had this amount of people and these were the students. Yeah, and I noticed I, that was my, my focus. I called it distance learning at, or distance education first. And then I guess I don't even know what I morphed to by the time I finished my dissertation. But I would do read a lot of studies from like Bernard and he would try to do these meta analyses where he's doing exactly what you're saying. And he said it was so um, heterogeneous as far as what the and, and so mm -hmm. ill-defined within the study where you're describing your participants and what um, the environment looked like, it was even hard for them to go back and try. To, and it makes such a difference if you, especially when he was doing some studies on, um, you know, it was um, student to student versus student to content and student to instructor. That's right. If those, if those relationships don't have the synchronous components or you know, whatever it may be that it make them different, um, it makes it really hard. <laughs> it makes it really and, then, hard. and then defining what is quality. You have to put quality in the context, Joel. And a subjective, it's, it's also very subjective, right? So I can tell you for the Caribbean, quality means that, hey, they're going to get tested and they're going to be examined and we have to sit and watch them to make sure they're not cheating. And that's quality in the perspectives of, an, of a higher level educator. A higher level educator to me is a government um, educator who um, is the ones passing down the policies <laughs> for education in any one country, all right? But then you have different perspectives on the other side of the world where quality just means that they get it, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? So you have all of these very, we use these terms and we use the scriptures and we use um, these variations and these meanings that are not universal. 
and then we write research. Mm -hmm. And then we report on the research and we don't unpack those descriptors. And then people recite your research. <laughs> So and, and, to me right now, it gets con a confoundation. It's just a confounded level of research going on where it's not clearly defined going on what I'm citing and how I'm citing going forward. And you brought up something I think it's really interesting, <clears throat> especially now we're working in the adult basic education has come into more focus for me and it probably was always into focus for you. We always assume a baseline technology from the learner's side. So if it's an online, if I'm pushing it out to you in a certain way, that's how it's defined. That doesn't necessarily mean how it's being consumed and how different that is. Correct. Uh, and you, you mentioned earlier, someone trying to take a, an online course on a cell or, you know, their mobile device versus a full great internet with a you know, 25 mm. inch monitor. It, it's quite a different experience. Um, you know, Correct. From that. Well, I have real questions for you, Camille. I've just kind of been chatting with you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we, I talked to Jason a lot before, you know, we wanted to make sure we we're touching on different things. And I think this would be, we were both excited about this question. So, um, so what are we doing as a field that we, we um, what aren't we doing as a field that we should be doing? And then what are we doing that we should stop? And I thought this would be a great question for you. Uh, <laughs> it's like, first of all, you'll be honest. <laughs> and then just your That's the problem with me. I'm too frank and honest. I get in a lot of trouble. Um, what should we be doing? Remembering the origins of instructional design. Mm -hmm. Re instructional design did not originate with technology. We are becoming quite pervasive now and everybody wants an instructional designer to help them do online learning, but nobody is calling for an instructional design to recreate or look at their classroom. Mm -hmm. yeah, we need to remind the people that instructional design or, or to even, um, <clears throat> redesign forms. How many of you guys go to the driving, the DMV, I know in the US it's called a DMV, um, or um, complete your taxes and the form is just ill structured. It's just not the best. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. That's where our origin came from. And we seem to have got lost into this technology wave and then forgotten our foundation that instructional design did exist before the wave of technology and computers and everything came about. So that's one thing I would like the, the, um, the field to remember, not necessarily do more of, but just remember going forward. Well, we talked about that with a couple speakers today. There's this push to change even our name. Um, and I'm, I don't care what we call us, but, you know, learning experience Ooh. designers or whatever it may be, we seem to not even want to embrace this idea of instruction that, ooh, that you know, <laughs> you can yeah. And yeah. You can't even um, hold on to the name. Well, AECT, how many years do you sit in sessions where they're defining the field? It's like, oh, my gosh, we my gosh, we can't even define our field. We have to do it every single day. Single day yeah. yeah, because it changes. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a moving target, one, because it's new, which is great. It's new, and people are now um, recognizing our worth, which is fantastic. It's a good time. We're young, and we're growing, and we're strong. Um, but at the same time, we have to make people aware. So we can't just keep pushing forward, but I think the awareness part is what we need to focus on, on remembering our roots and remembering why we did what we did and why we are who we are going forward. And so what about the, what do we got to get rid of? <laughs> what are uh, we doing? I don't that know. We <laughs> Let me see. Oh, no. I would, I would love to get rid of that term. Um, the, the, the term that I remember, I can hear Dave Johnson talking in my head. Learning styles is one term. Multiple oh, intelligence is there one you term. Go. There you go. Learning objects. He said, I, I was like, what's, Dave, what's your problem with learning objects? He said, what object learns, Camille? I was like, <laughs> oh, I didn't think about it that way. He goes, I hate that term. I wish they would just ban it from our field. And we're like, well, that's just a perception, right? He goes, yes, very subjective I was like, okay. That's how I feel about, like I just mentioned, I can, I can tolerate learning experience designer because you're designing the experience. But when they just say mm -hmm. learning designer, 
I can't design your learning. I can design yeah. conditions that will hopefully support your learning. And just, so that again is this idea of learning experience designer. But yeah. like, so that one's the one that's like nails on the chalkboard for me. <laughs> Similar to what you're saying with uh, Jonathan, like learning object. It's like, no. Nah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, 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 for the last two weeks, I was just doing grants with my, um, my faculty working with, we call it academics here, working on grants. And that term learning style came up so many times. I had to just go like, okay, just don't let the hate come out. Yeah. Calm down, read it in context and see if the person guides them appropriately. And it's, it's very hard. I'm not saying that learning styles don't exist. We all have learning styles just as much as we have a left foot and a right foot. But at the end of the day, um, we do want our left foot to be able to do some things that our right foot can do, just like kicking a ball or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, and the whole, being, yeah, the whole no, no, no significant difference. If I change mine to, prepare, you know, for your uh, style or your preference, uh, versus, there's no, I mean, we, we just all have to agree on that, right? <laughs> you can yeah. do it. And, and maybe it will be more. And then, and that's kind of like what, when my, within my dissertation, there were no differences for what I was studying uh, from outcomes, but maybe mm -hmm. persistence, uh, you know, and I'm sure that's what teachers see all the time, right? Is that your, the engagement and persistence may be an issue, but as far as whether or not it's going to change the outcome. Well, I think the basic, the basic myth out there is that we shouldn't be teaching to living styles. A lot of people, and I think that's one thing, we shouldn't be teaching to multiple intelligences. We shouldn't be teaching, um, you know, th those two terms, and this is just my perception and my own belief system, that um, I would like, and a lot of people know I talk about my daughter a lot because I learn a lot from her, um, I would like my daughter to be all rounded. I don't want her to focus on the one learning style she likes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and right. just do that for the rest of her life. <laughs> I wanted to be able to use all learning styles, use them appropriately based on the context she's in, and um, grow from that. Yep. So, you know? That's my whole I, I pra um, practice like you play, right? Like, to me, yeah. anyway, you got to practice like you're going to play. And you, yep. That's how life yep. is. Yes. <laughs> Nicole um, brings up a great point. Um, instructional can be interpreted as instructor centered versus learner centered. And that's true. You know, I think that is why a lot of people reject the instructional designer piece of it because it does in some ways imply that we're the all knowing and if you do it this way, you will learn. But um, I guess yeah, I call it the paternalistic. That's what, that's what a lot of um, people believe that, you know, that's, um, that the, I always say, my table in my classroom is not square, it's rounded. Mm -hmm. Square means their sides. Mm -hmm. And that typically, I'm on this side of the table and you're on that side of the table, so therefore the information should typically go one direction, all right? And I'll receive your information and then I'll go back. But there's never, in that square or that rectangle, there's never the belief that the information can go both ways at the same time. But when there's a rounded table in your room, guess what? It's an even playing field. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's an even ground. And um, everyone's at the same level. Don't ever have your, um, your, your lecturer at a higher level standing above you as a student because that means the power dynamic changes in the classroom or, or wherever the room is. And um, I also think of it differently in terms of personas. This is another aspect of the um, personas. As an instructor, I'm also the designer. I'm also the learner in that environment. If I've changed rooms or changed tools, I wear different hats as an instructor disseminating knowledge to a student. And um, it, it's a lot going on in a classroom that people just don't really necessarily unpack when they're delivering an eight week or 12 week or a 16 week um, lesson, they're just going to automatic and they just switch these hats and, and perform, not understanding that those hats contribute to an effective context. Mm -hmm. I love your, your, I mean, your table metaphor, I think I may. It's not mine, it's not mine, it was said to me somewhere. <laughs> Okay, I was going to give you attribution. It to me, but okay. <laughs> um, well, we've been asking everybody today um, is kind of a summary question. 
um, who has inspired you and, and, and who do you look to as, you know, something, I don't want to say a mentor, let's just use, keep the, keep the same wording. Like, uh, who, who would you say has in, inspired you? And, and it doesn't have to be one person, um, as, as an educator. Oh, and there's the, the inspiration behind me and she's a little topless. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just got up. <laughs> It's like, mom, who are you talking to? Yeah. Oh, I'm what? a single parent. This coming. We'll let you go. <laughs> that was a perfect. You even have visual aids, right? <laughs> yeah, right here. And that's, and that's my inspiration. Before her, I don't know, you know, if I could think that far back because, you know, when you become a mother, all of a sudden everything changes everything and your changes. world just revolves, oh. right? But Watching her learn and interact and reason is amazing. Uh-huh. And um, I got that. Um, the first person who told me about that was, once again, Dave Johnson. When he said to me, he watched his grandson, he sat there with his grandson, and looked at how he played, learned, and discovered. They mm-hmm. taste with their feet. That's why kids use their mouth a lot. Um, when they're blowing bubbles or what you think is blowing bubbles is them trying to form words and trying to practice the different things they do. They're the best form of experiential learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are the most experienced experiential learners until we strip it away, (laughs) strip it away and tell them sit and do what you're told, you know, in the classroom. (laughs) <laughs> Stop being creative. And then all of a sudden you have to be creative, right? We're only hiring really creative people. But for 18 years, we told them, you know, do it, do it this way. This way, right. But, and, and they, she's in the questioning mode, right? It's not the why. She reasons. Mm-hmm. And my husband always says, well, look at who her mother is. And that's what his yeah. reason is. Yeah. Okay. But- I just have to tell a story. So at AECT, you kept, she brought your daughter and you kept coming down and telling us all these stories of the, the drama, you know, that was happening. like... <laughs> Where on earth could she possibly? <laughs> it's got to be her dad, right? <laughs> yeah, no, you know, it's it's. Uh, uh, my mother would say we we were you know brought up very differently growing up, but my my mother says you allow her that word, you allow her to voice her opinions and to have an opinion and to talk, and she's four. Why would you ever do that? And I go like, because this is going to be her world. She's going to inherit this world. And better now before she gets socialized into knowing that she can't do certain things. Let her do whatever she wants until then. (laughs) Until it becomes illegal. (laughs) (laughs) Then then we've got an issue, right? Well, Camille, thank you so much for taking time out of your Sunday for you. And love you very much. Thank you for all you do for us at Designers for Learning. You're awesome. I hope you get your furniture soon. <laughs> <laughs> will do. We will. Yes. Okay. Enjoy your day. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.